Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 838. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 19th, 2024. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, where Kevin and George sit down in front of our web cameras, press record, and talk about the news of the day, whether it be local news, whether politics, Anglican news, or Christian. We're here to talk about things we find interesting. Um, do that because we like to do this. Uh, and I'm going to talk about YouTubers who are quitting in our first story here. But before we get to that, how you doing, George? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. I had a cold and I felt miserable. All the tourists coming down over the Christmas holidays bring their ills and bugs with them, and we locals catch it. And uh, But now I'm over it. Tomorrow, outside, if you see banging and noises and whatnot, we've got a St. Anthony the Great Fair tomorrow. Uh, if you're in the neighborhood, uh, 9 to 2. Lucanto, have, Florida. Uh, yeah. Lucanto, Florida, pet blessings at 10 and then 1. We've got uh, food and fun, bounce houses for the kid, demonstrations from the Sheriff's Department of Canines, the Sheriff's Posse, oh, uh, dog trainers, show, I think a utility, uh, agility dog train, agility jog demonstrations. <laughs> sure. We've got a guy who uh, runs a parrot mm -hmm. rescue and he's bringing all these parrots. I don't like parrots. But, <laughs> you know, it's the sort of thing that bring your kids and, uh, <clears throat> and we're having a rifle, a raffle. Uh, a rifle? Girls. You're rifling a raffle or raffling a rifle? Riffling the raffle on the rifle. <laughs> uh, we're raffling off uh, free tickets, a boys and a girl's bike. But you've got to be in Sunday school to win the raffle, <laughs> so they're going to keep picking until the person there wins it. That's good, though. That's clever. I didn't think of that. Uh, no, no. There you go. So, now, to be clear, you're not uh, putting together a helter-skelter for a uh, cathedral in England. This no, is not we have a, about no, this we have about eight acres. Of, uh, yeah, we've got eight acres uh, mm -hmm. of uh, maybe three acres of forest and about five acres of uh, rolling hills and uh, level areas cleared. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we've received last few years over the last year. Uh, we've seen three or four of the big farms have been sold. So the intersection down the road, for instance, which had farms on uh, two sides, yep. and then uh, where they built the Wendy's, has got a big development where they're putting in a Target and a uh, half, the, it's not a strip mall, but it's not an indoor mall. It's whatever the newest incarnations of malls are. Um, we're seeing development. We're my wife is so excited because we're going to get a Panera Bread and a Starbucks. Wow, that's and big time! A Panda, a Panda Express <laughs> and uh, uh, Target and Aldi, a supermarket chain. Uh, well, I think oh, it was five five years ago. Jill and I house sat for you uh, for a week when you went to some uh, island and, and did your 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 priest thing there. And you had the Walmart, you had a, a McDonald's and a Burger King. This is big time because once you go from a Walmart to a Target, you, you're now on the radar for consuming. And what they're building next to you is not a strip mall. They're called micro neighborhoods. You have a, a micro uh, strip mall where they, they they try to get everybody to make that your community, your neighborhood. You know, half indoor, half outdoor. Well, we're on the high, we're on the road just. Uh quarter mile up the hill. We're the highest point in the county. The, the old joke I've repeated too many times, <laughs> yes. Shepherd's Hills is the highest Episcopal church in Florida, meaning elevation, not uh, liturgy. And um, the other thing is they finished the highway to Tampa. Oh. Um, it's now, f to get to the Tampa airport used to be two hours through back roads if there were no uh, farm trucks overturned. Now it's uh, 45 minutes That's to nice. the airport. Wow. Yeah. It, lot, but we're not, connected that way to, we're not connected that way to Orlando, where the diocese is. We're connected to Tampa, okay. which is another diocese. So okay. what do you know? Okay. Uh, quickly, uh, I know half the earth is frozen right now with snow and blizzards. 
our viewers in North Dakota and South Dakota, I have a blizzard today. I'm sorry. If you hear in the background, that's my AC running because it's going to be uh, 75 out today. The sun is shining here in Florida. I apologize. I, I don't mean to make you guys feel miserable. You know, so. yeah, I am cold. It's, uh, it, it, it was it's 69 right now. <laughs> So, I mean, I had a service, but, you know, I still kept it on because it's a little chilly in the office in the high 60s. Here. <clears throat> I'm a Wisconsin man in Florida. You're a Florida man in Florida. That's hilarious. Florida man story. Okay, let's move on to the news. Uh, biggest news this January is all these popular YouTubers are quitting. Um, and G George and I are not famous YouTubers. We barely have 10,000 subscribers. And this is just a, a unique boutique uh, newscast that we put out once or twice a week where we talk about Anglican news. If I wanted to go for a bigger audience, I'd talk about Baptist news. If I want to go for a, 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 even a bigger audience, maybe Roman Catholic news or something like that. We're, we're unique and boutique, so we're not famous, famous YouTubers. However, putting the show out takes a little bit of effort. But these uh, YouTubers now who put out one show a week and uh, have discovered after 10 years that having to jump the shark every week is it's tiring. Uh, Tom Scott quit, Cutie Pie quit, all these people. And these people have made an income for the last 10 years on doing something that did not exist 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you could not put a, a, an episode on the internet and make money off it. It just wasn't something available to it. We now have a generation coming up in schools where, you know, instead of little Bobby wants to be a fireman and little Susie wants to be a nurse, they want to be YouTubers. I want to, I want to be famous. And uh, we've introduced our culture to a whole new dynamic with uh, YouTube and uh, other platforms like this. But now they're discovering in order to get an audience, you basically have to, you know, in our lexicon, jump the shark every week. George and I don't have to do that because we report on a church that jumps the shark every week. So it's, it's a little different for us. But I wanted to assure you, no, we're not quitting this year. Um, we're doing what we're doing. We, we like to do what we do. Um, this is very enjoyable. It's a ministry. However, I'm going to be up front here. One day, Anglican TV will be passed on to somebody else. Uh, I'll step down. Uh, George will retire from uh, ministry and uh, either Bishop George or, or, or Father George will retire and you know uh, sometime in, in the future uh, one five ten years down the road we will have to move on to, to other things but uh, we are not part of the uh, I quit YouTube culture yet George so I, I wanted to put that out there it's like 70 or 80 famous youtubers just quit this January because you know in order to to harvest an audience, uh, you have to make short videos where you're jumping off a building without a parachute. And then you get an audience. You die, but you got the audience you wanted. So, Well, I don't want you to sell yourself short, Kevin, because you, took, you started something with an idea, which I remember distinctly. You and I talked about this at the... Uh, uh, at ACF, oh, in Fort ACF, Worth. Yeah. The convocation yeah. in Fort Worth. Yeah. Yeah. And you asked me about it, and I, and I told you and Suzanne Gill that it was a bad idea. Nobody would do it. Nobody's well, here we are. <laughs> and to be honest, we have an average episode will have a larger viewership than the total number of people who attended serve church on Sunday in my diocese. Yeah, absolutely. No, and it, that's, that's, on one level, that's frightening. Uh, <laughs> well, it is because it's, it's, it's humbling. Uh, somebody told me this two or three years ago, Kevin, you are a YouTube influencer. I just like to talk about news. You know, people care about what you say, and when you say something, it has more weight than a priest or a bishop because uh, you've been honest all this time, uh, you've been humble all this time, and people watch because you're consistent. The church has not been consistent, Kevin, you have. George has been consistent. And you're not changing your doctrine or faith uh, when the wind blows differently. And, okay, I'm an influencer. That's, that's very humbling. The intent of this channel was never to do that. But George and Kevin are influencers. We have to, you know, we have to take that into account. That when we say something, 
uh, it has a little bit more weight uh, than we intended to. We intend to report the news, but some people report on getting in a little bit more trouble when we report on them. You know, like when we did the uh, the hymnal, the the new act of hymnal, uh, the guy in charge of it, uh, it got a little bit more flack than we had intended. You know, so it is what it is. George, let's move on to the news. I want to save our first story for last, George, because it's a big story. Um, let me All pull right. up the, the stories here. So our second story is GAFCON. General Secretary Paul Donison, who until recently was just a cleric, just a, a priest, is now a bishop, an assistant bishop in Rwanda. Um, I did not see in the news anywhere that uh, he was up for votes or how we do things here in the ACNA. We have an election in the diocese. Uh, this is something unique uh, to kind of an, an organization that is maturing but still has to uh, dot its I's and cross its T's. They said, well, we don't want just a, a rector in charge of GAFCON. He has to be a bishop. I'm like, well, why not an archbishop? So, George, let, let's try and explain this as best we can. We're going to start off by saying we're not talking about Paul Donison as a man. No. No, if no, anybody no, no, deserves no. this honor, if anybody deserves to be a bishop, Paul, in the SNA, Paul Donison does. I Paul is no problem with Paul Donison being a bishop. Ten years ago, I said of, he was the dean oh, of. Yep. Yeah. Ten years ago, I said he was bishop material, but he doesn't want to be. Now he is. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but. Laurent Mabondid and the other GAFCON primate said that with Archbishop Ben Kwashi retiring and being replaced by Paul Donison, we are more comfortable with the Secretary General of GAFCON being a bishop. And so Laurent Mabanda asked the Diocese of Gasabo in Rwanda, would you elect him as an assistant bishop? And then that was done, and then they asked the ACNA, would you take him on as an honorary assistant bishop in the Diocese of the South under Foley Beach? which I don't know the state of that, but I think that's the plan. So that Paul Donison, who is Dean of uh, Christchurch Plano, the cathedral, uh, and is also uh, well, yeah, head it's of the pro cathedral. Yeah. pro cathedral, is now a uh, bishop. I'm uncomfortable with that because, not with Paul Donison, but because of what I would call the sense that only a real Christian is, the only real Christians are bishops or priests. And we're in essence mimicking the Catholic Church, where we have people in the Vatican Curia who are titular bishops of uh, places. Uh, some may known to us like Archbishop Vigano, the uh, former uh, the fellow who uh, is so critical of uh, Pope Francis is a bishop of a, of a place that was once Christian but was overrun by Muslims a thousand years ago. The Catholic Church has a history of making titular bishops who are elevated into the hierarchy in the administration. I don't think that's an appropriate way to do things. And I also think it speaks to one of the great failings we've seen of GAFCON is that when you make it so Episcopal centric, every time the Archbishop changes, the province may go in or go out of GAFCON. We saw this with West Africa. We saw it with Central Africa. Tanzania, so. You know, and right. Tanzania. So mm -hmm. that when you are focusing where only the bishop counts, first, I don't believe that theologically speaking, uh, because I believe that when we talk about administration, we need to have the checks and balances of the laity and the clergy and the bishops all, if you will, either in tension, and in the Episcopal Church were always in tension, uh, but basically keeping checks and balances. And, you know, you, you have to start asking practical questions about uh, a bishop with no real C. Uh, no, I, and uh, here's where I, I agree with you, because I believe in the power of the laity. I believe laity in the Anglican Church and churches around the world, denominations around the world, laity is the first order. It's the order that is designed to get the work done. Uh, bishops and, and priests are there for teaching, instruction, blessing, and consecration, but the intended purpose of the church is to empower the laity. 
I, as a layperson, have run Anglican TV now for almost almost 20 years, and uh, I've always made maintained that you know it's going to be a a, a lay run organization. Uh, we're going to you know, keep this where we empower laity. You know, now George is an outlier for us, but you know we'll we'll, we'll keep him on. Well, some of our viewers keep saying, keep at it, George, and you'll be a lay person before you know it. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it won't take long. <laughs> but the, it really does come, I think, Kevin, I agree with you 100%. It really does come down to how do we understand God's economy in this world? Is it a top-down model where you uh, need the priest to know God? Well, we've got some of our viewers who would say absolutely positively, sure. without the sacraments, you can't be a Christian. <clears throat> We have some uh, charismatic and uh, viewers who would say, well, you know, that's totally lunacy. And I just don't see this as being an improvement. I see it as a distraction from the real mission, which is raising up believers in Jesus Christ, not building little administrative kingdoms. Again, I'm not talking about. We're Paul not talking Dunn's. about Paul. <laughs> Paul is going to be perfect for the role. He he has that gift of administration. I you know I think he's going to be perfect. The question is, why do we uh, bring out the little uh, magic wand and make him a bishop? Uh, because you're uncomfortable with that. I mean, come on. And also, from an Episcopalian's <clears throat> perspective, the problem in our church for the last 40, 50 years has been bad bishops. Uh, Bishops have not been an answer to our problems. They've been the cause of our problems. <clears throat> bishops who are clueless, bishops who uh, are, uh, you know, heads of the church of what's happening now, bishops who, you know, Kevin, in over our years, we've reported on pedophile bishops, adulterous bishops, alcoholic bishops. Yes, yes, say, uh, drunk driving bishops. Thieves, bishop, you know, thief bishops, uh, secret homosexual bishops, outward, you know. Wearing a purple shirt is no more a guarantor of your moral integrity uh, than wearing a wife beater undershirt uh, in Florida. No, and as a Christian, okay, that one really flew over the heads of some people. I'm sorry. I know it's a no, Florida like, man yeah. wears a sleeveless undershirt. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, sleeveless undershirt. It's uh, it, this is Hicksville, you know. But uh, you know, to I as a Christian believe I have the same ability to offer counsel and suggestions and teaching as a priest or a bishop does. And when I'm in the company of bishops, I'm treated as an equal. I, I've never, well, not in the Episcopal Church. Uh, in, amongst act of bishops, and even in the UK, bishops treat me as an equal, are willing to talk with me, uh, offer counsel, seek counsel. Um, it's, it's wonderful and strange, and the way it's supposed to work, all at the same time. But is that a function of Kevin of what we talked about in the first story of your being yeah. a YouTube influencer? You could be. Of you, yeah. you having you having a pulpit larger than any bishop in the ACNA in terms of who sees you every Sunday. If you were Fred Flintstone out here in Hooterville, and who had, uh, in other words, yeah. Well, I'm saying, are, I, are, are I, you I, a fair? Are you a fair? person again to in this issue I, well I don't yeah know. no I, I, that's a good point but i'm not wearing purple and they don't treat me as a stranger mm. okay they don't treat me as an outcast uh, it's not just the purple circle um and so and as such yes i'm 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 just i'm kevin i get it you know but all right we need to talk about a different story Paul, I, I've uh, put out a request to see if we can do an interview this week or next week. So we'll see if we can get that in the books and see what how he feels about waking up as a bishop. All right, let's move on to some UK news. We're going to talk about Prince William. Uh, in a book written, not anonymous sources, but a book written recently uh, that's been published in the UK says that Prince William is really not interested in the Church of England and may allow it to be disestablished. You know, who knows? And, you know, in my, my mind, it's not functioning as an established church under the government. Maybe disestablishment would uh, be something good for it, but it's a big topic. It's probably the most popular topic 
on Anglican Inc. right now and uh, on the on, on the Twitterverse. So let's talk about George. An biography of J Charles the Third came out, and mm -hmm. in it, royal sources are talk about William. Charles is a very spiritual, very religious. He, he may be a little eccentric, but he values the faith component of life extraordinarily highly. William is indifferent to it. William is like most uh, men of his generation. Yeah. He can take or leave religion. He'll go Christmas and Easter and weddings and funerals, but it's not something that is part of his current makeup. And this was then taken by this <clears throat> news that cannot be confirmed because the royal family will not answer direct questions on this was then taken by advocates of both sides uh, and run with, such that uh, there were articles, op-ed pieces at the Telegraph, uh, at the Times, and Gavin Ashenden was on GB News, uh, saying that if William doesn't feel he's, he, can, he wants to have anything to do with the Church of England, he really needs to allow somebody else to be king when it's his turn, because the crown is so intrinsically tied into the Church of England, it would take 15, 20 years of lawyers to undo everything. So either let's have a referendum, start the project now, and if people don't want to have a monarchy, if they don't want to have an established church, let's start the work now. But to say, well, I'm not going to do that part of my job, I'm sorry, then you can't have the job. Now, is this true? Nobody knows. I pretty much doubt it because the if you will, that element of the British society who has a religious bone in their body, Christian religious bone in their body, probably are the monarchy's greatest supporters. Yeah, I would and say that... This would be a very dumb move from a PR perspective. The royalty offers pomp and circumstance to a otherwise, you know, a not boring country, but a uh, unthrilling country. I, what's, what's thrilling about the UK is royalty. Uh, it's very big over there. It's bigger than other European countries that has royalty. And also pop and circumstance in uh, the UK is the church. The church allows for these big uh, uh, churches where you can have the baptism of a prince or you can have the wedding of a king and queen or the wedding of a prince and princess. And it's, it's broadcast to billions around the world. Uh, that pop and circumstance can't be done and well, let's think of Sweden. No, you know, they're not going to be able to pull that off. There's very few countries that could pull that off. And I think it would be silly to disestablish a church that he doesn't believe in because there's been many kings and queens over the history of the UK who've not fully endorsed the Church of England and they didn't let it go. So we'll have to see. Yeah. And let's just talk a tiny bit of PR management, something Kevin and I may have a bit of an insight in. Things are going to get bad for Prince Andrew in the coming months. Oh, jeez. Uh, because the the uh, Epstein, uh, Peter Pyle flights, the sex parties at the islands, and their video recordings. And if President Trump is elected, we have a new, <clears throat> new leader of the FBI. All of that stuff will be released to the public. And so you'll have little discrete squares over some parts of the video, but you'll be able to tell it's Prince <clears throat> Andrew with, with a... Uh, allegedly allegedly with an underage girl and that is going to be so damaging <clears throat> to the royal family and of course we've got the continuing antics of uh, harry and uh, megan that william really needs to be whiter than white squeaky clean standing for god country and yale as they would say in the united states yeah. Uh, you know, just, he does not need this stuff. Now, he's fortunate with his wife. I think Catherine is a woman who was dearly loved. Different high way high integrity, was. yeah, high integrity. Different way than Diana was, but I think is more, uh, maybe it's because of my age and generation, but I, I feel that she is, what, is it going to be an excellent queen? And uh, maybe she can say to William, what, what the hell are you thinking? Let's just <laughs> go to church, read the newspaper if you're <clears> bored, <throat> look, at the, uh, look at the hymn texts if you can't stand the sermon, but you gotta do this. But you're okay, he, he, here's for our kids. a great example. When 
uh, <clears throat> the Duke, uh, Queen Elizabeth's husband, was in the hospital in his later years uh, many times. Uh, Queen Elizabeth and the staff would put out a press release, please pray for, as we are, uh, the Duke. Uh, uh, Kate Middleton was admitted to the uh, hospital last week for some abdominal surgery. Nobody knew she was going to the hospital. And when the, the press came out, no, the presser from the palace did not say, please pray for Catherine as we are praying for Catherine. Um, it's just, it's a different dynamic. You know, she's in the hospital. She'll be there for 14 days. That's all you need to know. Different than the queen and how she taught uh, taught the society. You know? Oh, I, I do miss, miss uh, Prince Philip. Uh, he was just so fun and entertaining. Yes, he was. I can still remember uh, there was this little TV clip of him talking to British students uh, who were studying in China. And he said to them, oh, so you're going to come back all slanty-eyed and everything. <laughs> he just was just so unpolitically correct. It was just wonderful. It was such a breath of fresh air compared to uh, other parts of our society today. Uh, it's crazy. All right, what do we else got here? <clears throat> That's Prince William out of Story 4. Catholic, Catholic and Irish bishops denounce protest in Roscrea? Roscrea? Roscree. Ross Creek County. County Tipperary. Well, you could have phonetically spelled that for me. You know, I'm horrible at pronouncing things. So a, there's a, a small town in Ireland. There's a bit of a tiff going on. Over there, they call it a roll. And uh, let's talk about the row. The Irish government is commandeering a hotel in a small town in County Tipperary to house male migrants, uh, up to 300 of them. And the locals are up in arms because the hotel was, uh, you know, they're very proud of it. It's a small town. There's not much happening, not much going on. And their small community is now going to have 300 unemployed men hanging around with cash that comes out of their taxes in their pocket with nothing to do. And so there were some protests outside the hotel. Well, the Catholic Bishop of Tipperary and uh, Michael Burroughs, the Anglican Church of Ireland Bishop for that area, put out a joint letter saying, Oh, well, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were refugees, so we, could, we should welcome the refugees, too. Now, of course, that nonsense has been squatted down so many times. I, you know. Uh-uh. Jesse Jackson said it. Oh, okay. okay. And also, <laughs> Jesse on. said that Mary was an unwed <laughs> mother. Yes, I know. Um, but <clears throat> the issue here isn't so much Irish immigration policy, which is actually, you think you've got it bad in Britain, it's much worse in Ireland. The okay. number of people they're bringing in who <clears throat> refuse to assimilate, who the government's putting up, and we had riots in Dublin last month, or was it November? We're now having, they haven't started into riots yet in County Tipperary, but it's gonna get there because um, the elites in the Church of Ireland, in the Catholic Church in Ireland, in the Irish government have bought into the sort of World Economic Forum lie that people are interchangeable, that adding 300 unemployed young Muslim men from Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Eritrea, to an Irish small country town will not do anything. Well, it will do terrible things to the community and to the culture and they're just clueless. They have no sense of the uh, magnitude of the demographic changes that are taking place through immigrant invasion in parts of Ireland, uh, parts of Europe. And they're on the side against the small, against the common man. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. I had a conversation with a liberal friend uh, who was, you know, anti-capitalist and stuff like that. I said, name me a country where uh, we should emulate. And they, they named a European country. I said, that country you just named doesn't allow immigration like we do here in America. That country you named is all white. That country you named uh, has a minor uh, monarchy and is actually a capitalist country, not a socialist country. Uh, that, you know, we want, you know, you, you your dynamic is to hate America no matter what. Uh, it's not to 
find a better one. And when you find a better one, you don't know what you're looking for. And that's the same thing happening with the World uh, Health Organization and others. They don't know what good is. They just know what they hate. Let's say you're the vicar or the rector of the Catholic parish <clears throat> or the uh, Anglican parish in that tiny town. Mm -hmm. And your bishops are mouthing these platitudes. What is that going to do to your attendance? Well, most people, you know, what is it going to do to your faith community there? Most people couldn't care less, frankly, about, you know, far away things. But it's now impacting them. And this will drive people away because the only way they can express their outrage, because the government is cracking down on speech, is to vote with their feet and vote with their pocketbook. So you're gonna so these bishops who are virtue signaling are going to kill their respective churches in this area. So as the churches so as the community dies, the churches will die. The schools will fall apart because the people will not want to send their children to schools where there's now violence and cultural differences about boys and girls and uh, you know all the i don't need to repeat all this stuff that we all are well aware of but are afraid to talk about for fear of being accused of being a racist yeah i mean now hope let, let's back up the bible is very clear about what happens to a christian when they encounter uh, a immigrant, alien, somebody who doesn't want you treat them like you would treat Jesus. In the same respect, the Bible encourages uh, nations to have some rules and boundaries and uh, borders. And if I do not mistake in my interpretation of the Old Testament, it was all about borders. <laughs> and so I, 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 we have to look at two dynamics. How does a Christian uh, treat an individual who finds himself homeless or nationless, and how does a nation treat uh, a person trying to come into a country illegally? And in the last 20 years, we've lost that focus because we think everything's interchangeable, and it's not. Our, our job is to our job is to help improve the country they're trying to leave, and they're fleeing these communist, socialist countries in seeking a capitalist country, America. Why don't we try to encourage and reintroduce uh, economic reforms in these countries? Uh, Argentina is the perfect example of a country that may come around. What to see, George? Yeah, yeah December 2023, I think it was reported there were more immigrants, illegal immigrants, than live births in the United States. Absolutely. And if that continues, what does that do to our country? Because some of these people want to assimilate many Hispanics from South America assimilate fairly quickly into the American world. They love us. Yeah. It's those, it, but it is those who have, you know, predominantly from the Muslim faith tradition, not all, but less educated Muslims uh, who are walking across the border or come from the Indian subcontinent are bringing their pathologies <clears throat> that aren't working in Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan and Syria into our country. And they're not willing to start over and become part of a melting pot. They want to be in a mixed salad yeah. of the United States. Well, it's such a, I mean, the, the, I read a story last week about all the Chinese who have escaped China in one fashion or another, uh, don't need to have enough social credit to actually fly to America, have gone through the southern border to come into America. And they're not worried about having the documentation because they don't need it. You know, they come here, they say, I'm from a country, uh, that I've left, and uh, I just want to set that trial date so I don't have to show up for it. Uh, now, what's really interesting here in America is uh, we have conservative governors in the, the southern states that border Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, um, uh, Mexico, Arizona, except for California, Mexico. Arizona, yeah, except for California. And they have been shipping uh, illegal immigrants, people who cross the border without documentation or permission, to New York, which has, uh, it's a sanctuary city, but it's also a must house city. If you end up in New York City, uh, for any reason, whether you're homeless or whatever, you can request shelter. And if you're an individual, you'll get it for 30 days. If you're a family, you'll get shelter for 60 days. And it's on, it's, it's at the cost of the city. It costs you nothing. I didn't know this because I uh, had, I taken my kids to New York City on, for tourism to go see all this stuff. I could have got free stay. 
I could have knocked on the door. Hey, we're immigrants from Connecticut, and we need a place to stay. I didn't think of that, George. Now New York City, in order to fight this, is doing what Texas is doing. They're giving free plane tickets to anywhere in the world uh, for those who come through the southern border and end up in New York City. The Chicago mayor said, have mercy on us. Please stop sending illegal immigrants to Chicago. Denver, way over there on the west side of America, has, is screaming bloody murder because for some reason, unhealthy uh, illegal immigrants have ended up in Denver and have flooded the medical system there. Uh, it's cost them $6 million a week to uh, attend to the medical conditions of uh, people because Denver offers free medical care to illegal immigrants. That was probably a mistake. My problem is nobody's sending them to uh, uh, Portland or Seattle. The bus trip is too long, I guess. But uh, uh, it's just like, <laughs> uh, see, I bet New York is sending them to Seattle. It, it, it's crazy. Now, back up. I talked about what a Christian should do when they uh, uh, encounter a, a person who needs help. And I talked about, certainly we go through the Book of Romans if you want to talk about what a country is responsible for. But, George, it's crazy. Let's move on to the news. Uh, yeah, okay. Misconduct. Okay, Richard Pierce, Dean of Landorf, Landaf, Dorf, in the Church of Wales, is facing misconduct charges over his time as sub-dean of Christ Church, Oxford, when I read a sentence, people go, how are you an influencer? You can't even read a name. Well, I don't know. I don't know. What goes around comes around. Yeah. Uh, Richard Pierce was sub-dean of, Oxford, of Oxford's Christ Church Cathedral, Christ, you know, Christ Church College. And he was one of the people who, were dro who drove Martin Percy out and, uh, and on, as a trustee of the college. Well, well, back up. And who, who's Martin Percy? Martin Percy was the former dean who got off on a wrong foot, uh, not theologically, but just it was more personal. And, uh, you know, he was trying to modernize the cathedral structures and it just all blew up. And per, uh, Piers uh, was one of the ringleaders who drove him out. Well, the Charity Commission investigated the use of the college's funds, millions of pounds spent on fees and this and that, to get rid of Percy. And they found that this was wrong. And the Church of England got involved, and, Perse and Piers is also guilty of some sort of personal misconduct, which is not specified. Now, that could be any sort of sexual misconduct, or it could be his being a jackass to Martin Percy. We don't know. But... You know, Piers got uh, promoted up to uh, Landef Cathedral in Wales, and now the Church of England is coming after him for his conduct when he was subdean at Oxford. So, you know, there will be a reckoning one day, of course, at the second coming, but for others in their actions as priests of the Church of England in doing bad things may come sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next story. Dun, da, 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 da. Michael Curry. Yeah. Presiding Bishop Michael Curry and his assistant are accused of mixed conduct by the ex-wife and sons of retired Rochester Prince Singh Bishop. Now, that, I don't know if I believe the story, George. Okay, I'll I believe he's... <laughs> I mean, I'll go I believe. And say I don't believe it. Oh, okay, I believe that Michael Curry is being accused of misconduct. I I get that, yes. but I don't believe every. I'm not part of the movement called Me Too. You know, I don't Prince, believe every Prince, accusation. Prince Singh has adult sons in their early twenties, and now an ex-wife. And his ex-wife is a professor of women's studies or some sort of feminist uh, theology professor. Well, Singh got divorced, and he's since remarried, and it's been a messy divorce, and there were accusations of physical and mental cruelty, all the sorts of things that take place uh, in a messy divorce. Uh, years ago, when my wife started her, you know, as a lawyer, 30 years ago, 
In those days, when a woman joined a firm, they automatically put her in family law. So she did divorces and adoptions, and she hated that. Yeah. And eventually fled to the warmer climes of appellate tax work, which is so dull, it was safe from screaming women on the phone and angry men. Well, the wife of Singh, ex-wife, has accused Michael Curry of slow walking the case, of protecting Singh from investigation. <clears throat> Well, the problem is Michael Curry has been sick the last few months. You know, he's been in the hospital in and out. He's now out of the hospital, as a little update. He's now resting at home, but he's had several surgeries for brain bleeds. And I just think this is a case, my opinion, my opinion only, this is where the wife wants a verdict first and then have the trial. This is the uh, Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland approach. She wants to hurt her ex-spouse and is doing so through the uh, legal mechanisms of the Episcopal Church. And the church has to honor it because there might be some fire with all this smoke. But, you know, Singh has uh, never exhibited any of these uh, qualities of uh, treachery and physical violence that anybody else other than his wife and sons report now that they're getting divorced. Well, hold divorced. It. Uh, we don't want her, we don't want a trial where he's found guilty before uh, a trial. We don't want it one where he's found innocent. We're not finding him innocent. We're just saying that uh, not everything is always as it seems, as we discovered uh, with the uh, Bishop uh, Ruck incident in, in the Midwest. You, you, you never know. Yeah, you need to give these people slack because people can bring charges for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. Remember, Kevin, a few years ago, I was brought up on charges by a woman in New Zealand that we did a report on, on Anglican Inc., mm -hmm. because... Uh, I reported the court proceeding. Basically, she was a lunatic and- uh, uh, Alleged. Yeah, alleged lunatic. <laughs> and, you know, this woman wrote a letter to the bishop at the time saying, oh, I'm guilty of misconduct because I inferred that she was strange. And I pointed out to the bishop, all I did was report the court proceedings. I didn't make any judgments or, you know, there may be another stuff, but the point is, <clears throat> It cost her nothing but a stamp to basically give me grief for like three months. And eventually the bishop said, George, just take the story down. He said, you're right. 300 people have read it. No one else is going to read a story from New Zealand. So uh, now that's in the wilderness. Uh, yeah. And life went on. And it does. I mean, but that's part. Okay, there, George, you're an influencer. Okay. And... That's part of uh, this whole new dynamic. It's not a new dynamic. Uh, next story calls for Welby to quit after he boosted the canisty of Paula Vanellis. Uh, and this is the whole post office scandal that we talked about last week. Now, uh, an American is thinking of a post office as a brick building with the United States Post Office written on the side in, in uh, chrome lettering. It's a little different over there in uh, the UK, George. Several things I think I find fascinating about this. There have been yeah, yeah. a number of stories in the newspapers and on TV. Again, Gavin Ashenden, our friend, and another uh, Queen's chaplain have written and uh, talked about this on GB News or in the Times and the Telegraph and other outlets. And essentially, it calls for Welby to quit because he was boosting the candidacy of Paula Venels, who was a non stipendary priest, but full-time executive of the post office to be the next Bishop of London in 2017 or 19, 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. And Venels, uh, Venels had never been a rector or run a parish. She'd never run a diocese. She'd only run the post office. Mm -hmm. Welby had brought her in several times to be a management consultant. After, uh, and this all blew up with the, and he, part of the problem is that the Horizon Scandal, which is the name of the software made by Fujitsu that screwed up, was starting to unfold at the time that she was under consideration to be Bishop of London. And in fact, she knew at the time that the truth was that not that these poor postmasters and mistresses were guilty of theft, but their software had screwed up. And 500 some people were brought to trial over the fault of the post office. And Welby had wrote a uh, 
Well, the basically it has is on record writing say that this woman has profoundly influenced his understanding of the ministry. And the calls are coming from several directions. First off, Welby is a believer in the count of, 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 the, of the cult of managerialism, that a good business executive can accomplish anything, whether it's in the church, whether it's in an industry, whether it's anywhere. And I'm sorry, that's just not true. Now, there are some dreadful administrators in the church. I'm not saying that the church is a better place of administration, but you cannot, it's what I call the Linus Pauling principle, where Linus Pauling is a great chemist. He knew a great deal about vitamin C. Well, why should I listen to him about nuclear disarmament? He's not dead, so I'm not listening to him. But, you know, somebody who's good in one area, it's like listening to uh, actresses tell us about uh, pol politics. You know, you don't want to listen because you know that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. Well, what else has come out is that there were four candidates. And it's, it cannot be confirmed because this is all secret. But the four candidates were Paula Venels who was strongly backed by Justin Welby. That was his candidate to be Bishop of London because we needed a top flight executive with no pastoral theological skills whatsoever or experience in charge of the biggest diocese. Sarah Mullally, who was another person, but with no real pastoral or theological experience, but a little more time, she was a suffragan bishop. She had been the former chief nurse of England and then at midlife had been done a sideways move into the church. So that she was another candidate. And then we had two other candidates, Christopher Coxworth, Bishop of Coventry, and Graham Tomlinson, the Bishop of Kensington. And here's the sad thing. How different a world it would be in the Church of England if either Tomlinson or Coxworth had taken the post of London. Coxworth is now the Dean of Windsor and Tomlinson has, Tomlin has resigned as Bishop of Kensington to run uh, programs on church growth and evangelism. Tomlin and Coxworth are against living in love and faith and how different a world it would be. Yeah. And so the question is, Welby is just such a poor judge of character. And second, he couldn't get his man or his woman elected so that the blob the blob that has been pushing the Sarah Mullallys and the uh, Vivian Falls and these people to be is stronger than Justin Welby. I think it tells us a number of things. One, he's a bad, terrible judge of character. And two, is Welby really in charge? Well, yeah. It doesn't look like I know. Well, Welby's biggest sin right now is petting the wolves and, and scolding the, the, uh, the sheep. I mean... Easy. So, yeah, should well be fired? Yes, but not over this. You know, at a certain point, uh, you've in introduced enough heresy in the church you need to go. Uh, <clears throat> we, we're running short of time here, and I kind of wanted to, to hit that big story. You know, because right. it's going to take, take a good 15 minutes to cover it. We can talk about all this other stuff in, in next week's episode. So... <clears throat> Province for how many? We got like twenty nine provinces here in America in tech. Uh, Eleven, I think. Eleven. Okay, whatever. Nine. I'm sorry. Nine. Yeah, nine. Nine, uh, nine provinces here uh, in the Episcopal Church, and the province four bishops uh, wrote a letter denouncing Donald Trump as a Nazi, and I'll put a link to that letter in the show notes. And um, let me set this up. Donald Trump was the president of the United States for four years. He lost an election to Joe Biden. He's rerunning for election. And uh, for some reason, uh, I don't know why, but he seems to be the number one candidate for the Republicans to run against Biden. He just won a, uh, a caucus in Iowa where he came out with 51%. Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis basically tied uh, for second. And now they're going to go to New Hampshire, then South Carolina. And part of uh, electing a president is having primaries and caucuses all over our nation where uh, the candidates have to go basically to every state and sell themselves and say what they're going to do. And that state will, you know, tell, who, tell uh, the nation who they think is popular. Okay. Donald Trump is back in the, in the news. 
And uh, Donald Trump, and I've said this so many times, is his own worst enemy. I mean, he, he, he can't help but, you know, walk around sometimes with his shoe in his mouth. I, I think uh, if he talked less about what he thought, he would have more success in business and more success in politics. Uh, a lot of uh, politicians have discovered not to say everything they've, they, they think. Ronald Reagan did not say everything he thought. Uh, he, he knew to stay on message. Uh, Donald Trump does not stay on message. Biden doesn't even know what the message is. And if you ask Kevin, hey, uh, uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Trump, I would say, regrettably, Trump is a better candidate than Hillary Clinton. And I made a lot of money in the four years that, that Donald Trump was president because I knew how to, to run my stocks in, a, uh, in that type of environment. Uh, Biden, Trump, well, yeah, Trump is going to be a little better than Biden. And, uh, you know, so what happened? Well, not everybody agrees with Kevin. Uh, but please understand, Kevin never voted for Trump. I just, you know, at the end of the day, I could not, as a Christian, get over Trump being his own worst enemy. However, when he was president, I did support many of his policies. And I used those policies to live this type of lifestyle. George is a Trump supporter. And when you said this to me, I said, he's not even on the, the radar. He's already upset the Episcopal Church. So let's talk about the letter. Um, and But we don't want to offend every bishop who doesn't like Trump. I don't care if you don't like Trump. What I care about is whether you're calling somebody a Nazi in an official capacity as a bishop. So let, let's try and dissect this. I wanted to introduce the polity because if you're like in the Congo and you're watching uh, Anglican Unscripted, you probably didn't know that Trump was, you know, coming up again for re-election. So I, I wanted to back that up. It's going to be a long topic, George. Um, is it okay not to like Trump? Yes, it is. Some people it's like snails. Some people yeah. like oysters. I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I actually, I, I uh, have, I voted for Donald Trump uh, one twice, yeah. and uh, I would, I'm going to vote for him a third time. Sure. Uh, I have no problem with uh, what he says or what he does. I think that he's ideal for the country at this time. And having been said, I'm not uh, one who is. Uh, primarily political. In fact, I wrote to one of the bishops who signed this letter before you last night saying, I'm going to say some harsh things about the letter, but I want you to know I'm not saying them about you, uh, because I respect you as a bishop and as a theologian and as a pastor, but I think you've got the wrong end of the stick on this. Well, let me sort of lay out what's happening. On December, uh, January 9th, uh, the bishops of Province 4, which is basically Texas and uh, lower Midwest in that area, put out a letter where they, critic and they criticized Donald Trump and they began to say, we're not political pundits and we support Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and we're not saying who we should vote for, and we agree immigration is a worry, but we want to speak up on something that Donald Trump said that we find offensive. And I'll read the two paragraphs to you that uh, are the heart of the letter. Donald Trump, our former president, has recently called immigrants vermin and has said that they poison the blood of our country. A clear example of racism, in this case with the eugenic edge, one could not find. When the parallels to the Nazi rhetoric were pointed out, Trump claimed he knew no such thing, but then he repeated the very same statements and he most certainly was aware of the parallels. The idea of racial purity is an idol, something false and harmful to which people bind themselves. As such, it presents a corrupt doctrine of the human person. It's the human person, per se, who is in the image of God. Now, let me start off by saying, since 2016, Donald Trump has been accused of being a racist and a Nazi. And Donald Trump has been accused of so many things that are false over the years, from the fine people hoax where Donald Trump allegedly commended uh, neo-Nazis at a march in Charlottesville. That turned out to be false and a lie. To, uh, 
having your prostitutes in Moscow hotel beds mm -hmm. urinate mm -hmm. on him to, oh, in other words, there's probably a dozen, 15 outright lies that have been uh, recirculated and are believed by a great many people in the United States who despise well, Donald Trump. Great example, the Steele dossier. Okay, it was a yeah. document paid for by the Clinton campaign, uh, which has all these stories in it about the, the awful things Trump did. When uh, Trump was finally out of office, they investigated the, the uh, Steele dossier and found that it was false. It was uh, made up by a political pundit. So... So now, is this is this false, or is is this a bona fide criticism of Donald Trump? Well, I don't believe it is, because Donald Trump was speaking in a political circumstances, and he was talking about the fentanyl crisis. Immigrants are bringing fentanyl, illegal immigrants, and the cartels are bringing fentanyl into this country, poisoning people, and a hundred thousand people have died last year, I believe. And so when Donald Trump is talking in heated political rhetoric of poisoning the blood and these vermin bringing up narcotics over the border, he's doing it not in a sense that these people, because they are not uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, are somehow debasing this racial ideology point, is completely absent from Donald Trump's words. And it's completely absent. Donald Trump, if he were such a racist, would not be the one who he's the he is the most popular Republican among his blacks since yeah, the 1920s. Absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. Donald Trump has, you know, you go to the South Bronx, you go to Baltimore, you go to Chicago, the South Side of Chicago, and you hear black men praise Donald Trump. It's this idea that he's a racist, those who should have it on their radar don't see it. Those who do see it are the white upper middle class bourgeois who have no contact with minorities other than those liberals who follow their own world or thinking. So first off, we need to go into what Donald Trump said and didn't say. So this is either a willful misrepresentation based on MSNBC reporting or a blindness to the truth. And instead we see repeated here Something that, in essence, the bishops of Province 4 are saying that they can read Donald Trump's mind and he doesn't do things the way they like. Well, frankly, it doesn't matter what they think. Now, here's one, some telling things, several points to make. First, this letter came out on November, uh, January 9th. What's today? Uh, the 19th? Have you seen anything of this in the world press, the secular press? You've seen it on Anglican. Well, no, the Episcopal Church is nearly dead. No one cares. Yeah. So, number one, nobody, <clears throat> excuse my language, gives a damn what these bishops say. Now, there's the issue of what about is, which I never like because it's not a good art, argument, but I'll do it anyway because I'm, I'm that much of a, of a, a showman. How come I've never seen anything about the deplorables? You know, when Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, Clinton, or Joe Biden denounce the white working class as the problem, denounce the white working man and the working woman as the reason why there's all this evil, denounce the United States, and you have people on television with such vile racial rhetoric that they'd really mean in a racial sense, and the bishops are silent. Yet, when Donald Trump says something about criminal gangs bringing fentanyl into the United States, poisoning the blood of our people. Donald Trump's been to the South Bronx. He's been to Chicago, south side of Chicago. He's talked to these people who are saying that immigrants are destroying our neighborhoods. <clears throat> drugs are destroying our children. I've had, I've had a prisoner who died, a young person who died from fentanyl poisoning. So this is an issue for me. How are the bishops in their ivory towers uh, divorced from the reality of pastoral life? going to have any, and who only basic, you know, I've been on diocesan boards and commissions, and it's a waste of time, because you basically, they're all filled with yes men and yes women. Bishops have no real sense of the world of that they're leading, and they're basically tolerated politely, because they're either a source of income or employment. But are they theologians? Are they people of moral character? Sadly not. 
I think but, I want but, to, I, I'm going to say that I'm going to stop there because there's an article, there's, an, there's a comment published on Anglican Inc. that I think is worth pointing to. It's by Warren Mueller. And he lists five points. And I encourage everybody to look at this because Warren Mueller says very concisely what I, I believe and that his, he closes with, Donald Trump is not the problem, you are. In other words, he, point five, we invite fellow Christian leaders to cleave to the word of God. That's a quote from the statement. And Warren writes, since when? The affirmation of homosexual relations and so-called mm. homosexual marriage, the advocacy of transgenderism as well as the endorsement of abortion, which you proclaim is absolutely not of God. Now, here we have an imaginary problem with Donald Trump, which the bishops complain about, yet they're silent or they're supporting abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, racial preferences. They're supporting the destruction of a nation that's taken 300 and some odd years to get to this point and could be over very quickly. And so I think the bishops sadly because nobody cares what they have to say, aren't going to be of any influence. But it really, I think, is a mistake for them to get involved in these political waters when they really don't know what the hell they're talking about. Which is one of our problems. I mean, here's many nobodies putting their names on a, a letter. Why do I have to report on it? You know, uh, I, I, <clears throat> I, I don't need Anglican scripted to make something famous that isn't famous, you know. Well, Kevin, yeah. we take it back to that first story, jumping the shark. Yeah. I have and this to tell is it. you. That I, is jumping the shark. I was, and what, when I read this letter, I was furious because, uh, you know, when Michael Curry gets on his high horse about January 6th being the worst insurrection since the Civil War. Yeah, whatever. I care less because Michael yeah. Curry is Michael Curry. Yeah. And I'm happy to report it because everybody who reads it knows, but knows you, know, you can't take him seriously. <laughs> You can't take him seriously. <laughs> oh, quiet, please. Quiet, please. And, and uh, oh, I've got people on the uh, walking into the office. What was I saying? <laughs> no, that's right. So let me finish up. And I've said this story before, but it's the Paul Ryan story. Uh, early in Donald Trump's first. Uh, um, foray as a president uh, he was on Twitter uh, all the time and Paul Ryan was at a press conference after some Senate vote and uh, a reporter misquoted Trump and asked uh, misquoted a tweet by Trump and asked Paul Ryan to respond on it and Paul Ryan absolutely believed that Trump had said that absolutely believed the quote he was hearing was real and went off on Trump like nobody's, nobody's, I, I mean, if he was your mother, you're gonna get a whipping. I mean, Paul Ryan went off on Trump. And then Paul Ryan discovers it was all a lie, that this reporter had misrepresented what the tweet said. And he was, I, I don't get it anymore. If I can't trust the press and I can't trust anything, any, and you know, six months later, he got out of politics. You know, this is just, it, it's horrible. Uh, that we have a press that misrepresents things, but this is not going to be a, a, a Trump defense uh, channel unless bishops and, and clergy start talking about uh, them without checking the facts. Uh, I, I don't want to wake up every day and defend uh, Trump, but if, if clergy have to, to delve into this, uh, y you make my job harder. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 838 of Anglican Unscripted.